Misguided was one of the world's most popular fast fashion brands, raking in over £100 million in gross profits in 2017 from sales in the UK, US, Australia and Europe, and was valued at over £700 million. As fast fashion exponentially grew in popularity over the years, it was expected that Misguided would too. However, something went wrong. Whilst rivals like Boohoo, Shein and Pretty Little Thing thrived, Misguided tanked, never quite reaching the heights expected of one of the pioneers of online fast fashion. Misguided went bust earlier this year, leaving thousands of customers out of pocket without receiving the items or the refunds that they were promised. But the brand has been taken over and is trying to make a comeback. The question is, is it even possible to return from such catastrophic brand failure? Hey guys and welcome to today's video where we are going to be talking about the rise and downfall of online fast fashion brand Misguided who went from being one of the most prominent fast fashion brands in the business to being put into administration in late May this year. So we're going to be discussing the life of the brand and how its downfall can serve as a cautionary tale to all of the other online fast fashion brands who fail to keep up with the industry at large which has massively changed in the past few years. So we'll be looking at everything that contributed to the brand's failure in both the long and the short term and examining whether the recent takeover will enable Misguided to get back on its feet or whether that ship has well and truly sailed. So before we start, make sure you are subscribed down below with notifications on and don't forget to leave a like on this video if you do go on to enjoy it. Okay, so before we dive into Misguided themselves, I think it's important to have a brief history of fast fashion generally and how the industry has evolved to become what it is today because the this is the industry obviously where Misguided operated. They were one of the first brands to pioneer the online only model, but also changes in the industry are part of the reason why Misguided ended up failing. So fast fashion refers to a large section of the fashion industry where the retailer's business models rely on fast and cheap production of low quality garments, which will have a short store life cycle. And what I mean by short store life cycle is that these garments will not be on sale for very long. They generally aren't available in stores for longer than kind of a month because the store will rotate stock extremely often to keep customers interested and keep customers coming back and make sure that they're keeping up with the evolving trends by producing new and fresh garments. So the term fast fashion was actually coined in the 1990s by the New York Times in an article describing the arrival in New York of Spanish fast fashion giant Zara and the brand's ambition to take no more than 15 days to get a garment from design to being available in store. The idea of fast fashion had been brewing for many years, notably since the 1960s, where people started to reject the kind of previous ideals of having a few well-made or homemade pieces in their wardrobe, and instead they wanted affordable clothing and lots of it. So between the retailers who started their brands in the mid 20th century, it's hard to pinpoint who exactly pioneered fast fashion and who pioneered the type of in-store fast fashion that the New York Times was talking about. But these kind of brands included Zara, Topshop, H&M and Primark. And the trend evolved through the 1990s and the 2000s, with the New York Times writing that H&M's arrival in the US in 2000 came at the right time because it was seen as chic to pay less, with high-end fashion going out of style whilst affordable fast fashion was on the rise. So this trend of affordable clothing carried on right through the 2000s, the 2010s and now into the 2020s and has been referred to as the democratization of clothing because now it doesn't necessarily matter what economic or social background you come from, you are still able to express yourself through clothing due to the wide variety of affordable garments that are accessible to people who do not have the kind of money that people in like the 1980s who were buying high-end brands had. So fast fashion, however, experienced a drastic change with the popularization of the internet and brands like Misguided took fast fashion into an online only environment. So before brands like Misguided and Boohoo came along, fast fashion was mostly about getting clothes into stores as quickly as possible. Whereas with an online only model, the time taken to deliver an item to a store can be cut out of the equation and instead that time is spent getting a garment to a person's house, making the time that it takes to get a garment from design to sale even shorter. And instead those delivery times were put into the hands of the postal service who would deliver the item to the customer. So they basically just cut out the middleman of having a store 
or that the clothes would go to first. So fast fashion websites also weren't restricted by the size measurements of a brick and mortar store, only by the size of the warehouses. So they could keep more stock and introduce more items each day than their in-store counterparts like Zara and Primark could because a website has infinite room on it and a store only has a certain amount of clothes that it can hold. So when the recession hit in 2008, in-store shopping fell massively, but the internet continued to grow. So this spurred the development of Misguided and other brands like it with only ASOS having been established as an online only retailer prior to their financial crash. These online retailers grew quickly because they didn't have as many overheads to cover as brands that were opening in-store they didn't have to rent out ground space, they didn't have to pay as many staff, and they could use that money to buy more warehouse space and therefore stock more designs, having to only pay for the floor space for the warehouse and for the garment production process. This industry like absolutely boomed over the next 15 years or so with phones and laptops becoming staples in people's lives and the convenience of online shopping bringing more customers to these fast fashion shops every single day. You know, they can browse through thousands of items to find exactly what they want without having to leave their sofa. Whereas if they had to go to a physical store to find what they wanted, they would have to take time to travel to the store, they would have to take time to walk around and there's no guarantee that they're gonna find exactly what they want. Online fast fashion solidified itself as the cheapest and the most convenient way to get what you need and get it fast. Okay, so now we have a brief history of fast fashion and how the industry has evolved in recent years. Let's specifically talk about Misguided. So Misguided was founded in 2008 by Nitin Passi. He had studied business management at university and then started to work post-graduation at his dad's fashion company, which focused on designing and importing garments that were then sold to high street and department stores in the US. So Nitin worked for two years in New York in his business and he learned a lot about the fashion industry from this. However, this particular company focused on the kind of 35 plus age range and they ordered massive quantities of basic garments which would have lead times of about six months, meaning that garments were being ordered three seasons in advance and were taking six months to produce. And Nitin decided that he wanted to specialise in fashion for younger people and having seen the headlines during the recession that the only sector experiencing growth in this time was online and the internet, he took a loan of £50,000 from his father and decided to create the misguided brand. So the founder of the brand obviously was not self-made because his family was already running a successful fashion company and he was able to start this brand because his family had enough money to loan him £50,000 to start his own business, which is an opportunity that most people would not be able to have available to them. So the website opened in March 2009 and Nitin was the only person working for Misguided for the first six months. He stated that his business model at that time was wholesaling, so he would buy one or two pieces of stock from wholesaler, photograph them, and then if he would get an order, he would then get that piece of stock in the size that had been ordered. So there was no holding of stock. He wasn't ordering things in bulk and then trying to sell them. He was literally ordering one thing and then if it sold, he would then order more of it and ship it out to the customers. And he was doing all of the ordering, the photography, the uploading, the writing of product descriptions and all of the customer care for the business. And he advertised through Facebook and offline, although it's not specified what he actually means when he says offline, whether that's kind of newspaper adverts, magazines, posters, local shops, etc. But to begin with, the business was pretty small and run entirely by him but it still managed to turn over £100,000 by November of 2009. So the first employees hired were one person in customer care and one person to pack orders who, by the time of 2019, the person who was packing those orders was still working for Misguided and all the other functions were outsourced. Again, not entirely clear what it means by all other functions and which functions were outsourced, but obviously the brand didn't have any factories yet, so they weren't designing and producing their own clothes. So I would assume that the other functions includes the entire design process. So the timing of the brand's launch meant that these first few years allowed Misguided to try and test things to find a process that worked for them and grew their brand authentically before the online space really matured. So the early mistakes didn't matter so much because there wasn't as big of a customer base or as big of an audience who were looking for online shopping. So people weren't really finding out about Misguided. Um, so by the time online shopping really took off, Misguided had found its feet. 
and it finally employed its own design team in 2012 and the first in-house design debuted in the autumn 2012 collection. So the main strategy for the first kind of three to four years was to let the products push the sales. There wasn't a massive amount of money put into the customer experience, i.e. the website, what it felt like to shop from them. And there wasn't much money put into marketing and advertising either. It was only once an in-house e-commerce team was developed that the misguided branding really started to emerge, which I think is a big driver in which brands people shop from nowadays. People want to log into an easy to use website. They want to have an aesthetically pleasing layout with the best possible e-commerce technology to make their shopping experience as easy and simple and enjoyable as possible. And once the team started to do this, Misguided started to grow even more and they went from turning over 12 million in 2013 to 100 million in 2017. And Nitin has said in an interview that the main strategy that the brand was using to get ahead of its competitors was vertical supply chains, meaning that Misguided was in charge of its own factories here in the UK and in China, so they could quickly react to new trends or celebrities' outfits and create a product in as little as three days. Like they always wanted to set themselves apart from other fast fashion retailers based on the speed that they could produce garments at rather than buy the garments themselves and this is something that we're going to come back to later. So Misguided also started doing celebrity collaborations from 2014 onwards with the first being Nicole Scherzinger. Now this is a slightly unexpected choice but Nicole had worn three Misguided outfits and pieces of her own accord. They had not paid her to do this, there was no sponsorship involved and this had resulted in those items selling out pretty much straight away. So the brand decided to collaborate with her having already seen how well her image can sell their clothes. So at the time she was an X Factor judge and she was regarded as being a kind of best dressed celeb in the magazines. So it was no surprise that this collection did extremely well. And they then did a second collaboration later on in 2014. And at this point, Misguided was only growing with the celebrity collaborations continuing, the most successful of which being the Playboy collaboration, which launched in 2019 and added more lines in 2020. Uh, and Misguided also during this time expanded into the US, Australia, France and Germany during this period and launched their first ever in-store products in a deal with US retailer Nordstrom. And this was quickly followed by launches into Selfridges in the UK, starting in Manchester, then opening their own misguided stores in Westfield, London and Blue Water Shopping Centre. However, despite the plan to open four more physical stores after this, the Westfield store closed less than three years later due to underperformance and the other planned store openings were scrapped. So the mid 2010s marked a period of extreme growth for Misguided or so it seemed, but behind the scenes, things were not going as well as the brand put on with 2017 kind of been being the beginning of the end for Misguided. So 2017 marked the first year that Misguided made net losses. Despite the £100 million turned over during the year, it was reported that the brand actually lost £1.45 net in 2017, down from profits of £380,000 in 2016, despite a 40% growth in online sales generally. And this only got worse, with 2018 marking a loss of £46.7 million after tax. 26 million before tax. And this is a massive loss. This is really quite concerning for our brand, considering that there were no major incidents in 2018 that this loss could be attributed to. It wasn't like in 2020 when there was a pandemic or like now in 2022 when there's a cost of living crisis. There was literally nothing that the brand could really blame this loss on except themselves. And it's also worth noting that in 2018, Misguided was the sponsor of Love Island, meaning that they provided a constant supply of new outfits to the people on the island and claimed that this increased sales of featured garments by 9,000%. So to make a loss of that amount, whilst the brand's visibility was being massively increased by sponsoring probably the biggest reality show in the UK, is quite staggering and speaks to there being a big issue internally. And this is something that I find particularly interesting to note because the fact that the brand lost £26 million in 2018 and nearly went bust 
is a big, big point made to viewers of the Inside Misguided docuseries, which released in 2019 as an attempt to reignite interest in the brand. And they mentioned it in the introduction and it's talked about throughout how they've come back fighting and they don't want to see, make the same mistakes, but it's never really actually explained what happened. Like considering how much they talk about it, I expected there to be an episode dedicated entirely to what went wrong in 2018. But no, the fact that they lost money is constantly brought up, but no one seems to want to explain why they lost all of that money. Uh, apart from a section where they're buying stock for a Christmas collection and they talk about not wanting to make the same mistakes of overbuying things that people don't want. And this documentary initially released on Channel 4 in August 2019 with episodes being premiered once per week over a four week period and it premiered to very mixed reviews with 4.9 out of 10 stars on IMDb so like smack bang average and it recently has become available on Netflix. I think it was in April or early May this year. So more people than ever are watching and talking about this documentary. Now, to give credit where credit is due, Inside Misguided felt like a fuller and more authentic look at a fast fashion brand than the Pretty Little Thing by Molly May documentary that I reviewed earlier this year. I have a video reviewing that series in full, which will be linked down below if you want to go and watch that. I'm not gonna go into as much detail ab about Inside Misguided because I don't want this video to be two hours long, but it is better produced than the PLT one and it gives a broader overview of the Misguided brand. However, I do still think that it missed the mark. So I think what I'm gonna do is just give a quick summary of anything of note that crops up in each episode for the sake of time. And then we'll talk more about the overarching issues at the end of this section. So episode one showcases the brand's focus on Instagram by showing the shooting and release of a collaboration collection with Jordan Lipscomb and talking about the brand's strategy for trying to get Molly May to sign a deal with them following her stint on Love Island, which if you've watched any of my previous videos about Molly May and PLT, you will know how well that went for Misguided. So also, side note on this, they wanted to use Molly's teddy that she had with her in the villa that became a kind of staple, and they wanted to use it as a selling point by making an outfit for it when they went to go and do the pitch. Um, but they actually got the teddy's name wrong. So the teddy was called Ellie Belly, and they described it as Nelly Belly, which is like a, it's a very small thing, but when you're offering an influencer £350,000 for a sponsorship deal, you would think they'd want to do everything to make sure that they got the details correct. And I feel like this is indicative of the brand's attention to detail overall. So in the part about the Jordan collab, there's a comment made by Treasure, who is the senior campaign and creative manager, about how there was a ton of pressure on them because the collab needed to turn things around for the brand and she joked how she liked that it drained her soul. And this is something that I wanted to hang on to because the fact that the brand has one thing that it's relying on to do well and it doesn't have kind of multiple profitable projects going on at the same time so that if one fails they've got like a load of others that can cover for it indicates to me that the management just wasn't that good like a company as big as misguided should not be putting all of its eggs in one basket and putting that much pressure on its employees to get things 100 percent perfect all of the time because otherwise the brand will fall back into the red is uh, you know a little bit mean to put that on an employee's shoulders like it should be the management who are spreading things out evenly so that if one thing fails it doesn't matter too much because all the other things are successful like when they're putting all the money they have into one collaboration that just doesn't seem like a smart business decision to me and they also mentioned when introducing a few senior people that they're all kind of in their very early 30s so being in their position is really impressive which it is, you know, to be like a senior brand manager or head buyer or whatever at like 30 is massively impressive. But it does make me wonder whether the failure of the brand partly came from not having enough experience. You know, they're hiring people into or promoting people into senior positions who may not have worked in that position before. You know, they've worked their way up at Misguided, but they have no experience in that position yet. So rather than focusing on people who have substantial fashion business experience, they're looking for young people they can promote because they think that those people will have the right vision for the brand. But I do wonder if not having that experience on board is part of the reason why they couldn't get themselves out once they were in the red. I'm not saying those people who were young were bad at their jobs. Their you know, age doesn't stop you from being really good at whatever you do. But not having anyone on the team who's grown a business before could have been detrimental because no one at Misguided had a wealth of experience and knowledge of how to form a successful long-term brand strategy. 
And next up, they show us the buying process with the example of, no offense to anyone who's bought this dress, but quite possibly the ugliest dress I think I've ever seen. It's giving bodycon bin bag and I'm just not here for it. Um, it's fitted on one model with no other sizes tested. And once it's established that she fits into it, they then get on with ordering it. Like, they don't bother to test it on other models, on, you know, slightly bigger people. And this is something they come back to later where they say the plus size stuff that they buy is being returned like 50% of the time because they're not shaping it on a plus size model. So that's fun. The buyer in this case phones the supplier to ask for the price and haggles it from £7.50 to £7.40. And I don't know if it's just me, but that doesn't seem to be something positive that you would want to show when it's already speculated that you pay garment workers like less than minimum wage. Like when you're facing those kinds of allegations about the brand and the industry in general, why would you want to show people your buyers haggling to get things as cheaply as possible even if it's only a reduction of 10p because that kind of indicates that the brand wants to do everything as cheaply as possible and therefore they are going to pay their workers as little as they possibly can. So episode two starts with an epilogue about how all fast fashion brands are seen as the same and misguided are trying to be different but in reality they did not achieve that goal. Misguided were extremely forgettable in relation to their other fast fashion rivals and I think that's down to actually the clothes just being less appealing than what other fast fashion brands were offering. Like whenever I scrolled through Misguided I would find maybe like three things that I liked whereas if I scrolled through other websites I'd find like 30 and I just don't think that they got their USP right in terms of the customer base that they wanted to appeal to and I don't know if that's just me and Misguided just was not my style but it kind of seems like they wanted to appeal to me i'm in their customer demographic but they just didn't for some reason like i don't i can't put a finger on what was wrong with it but the clothes just didn't appeal to me this discussion then leads straight into a campaign about diversity and i don't think that this was a good creative decision because the overall story given by this sequence is that they're using diversity to try and make their brand seem different rather than because they actually want to cater to all of the diverse people that they have in their campaign and I'm sure that's not the intention but this choice of narrative in this context just did not work in my opinion. Also later in the episode the headquarters get told that one of their adverts has been taken off air because it is objectifying women so it's not really a good look to make this big deal about empowering women and campaigning to be diverse and different and then get told off by the advertising standards agency because you're producing content that objectifies women. And they then talk about a successful marketing campaign where the boss's Lamborghini was wrapped uh, and decorated with the brand's name and Pamela Anderson which supposedly went viral. This this is the first example of this disruptive advertising angle that they push throughout the documentary but they then go on to say that they're doing the same thing again by wrapping a Rolls Royce in pink branding and then hiring Gemma Collins to promote it and this is a replica of exactly what they did before you know pink car celebrity and to me that doesn't say disruptive brand doing the same thing over and over again is just going to make that thing less effective each time because it worked in the first instance because people hadn't seen it before. Each time you now do it again, they've seen it. They're not going to pay attention to it because they've seen it before. It's not new. It's not interesting. So it kind of defeats the whole purpose of wanting to be a disruptive brand if you're just constantly repeating ideas because an idea can only be disruptive once. So episode three focuses on the Christmas party season and finally gives acknowledgement to the environmental problems of fast fashion since up until now they've been proud of how fast their fashion is and how fast they can cycle through stock. And it shows the corporate social responsibility manager going into a factory and inspecting it and seeing whether it's a suitable supplier for misguided. And he talks about how it's harder to become a supplier for misguided than for any other fast fashion businesses because they want reputable factories with good working conditions. And they say that the reason for this is that in 2017, they were caught up in a scandal about unethical practices no explanation of what that means so I've taken it upon myself to find out what this scandal was and apparently they were using a factory that was paying workers three pound an hour so back to that point about trying to do things as cheaply as possible and this is very much brushed over there's literally no explanation of how or why they ended up using this supplier that was paying workers this much what they specifically did to respond to the outcry and how their selection processes for their suppliers have changed 
And granted, this is not a CSR or an ESG report, this is a documentary, but I don't like that they're saying that they're stricter on ethics than other brands, but there's no evidence to really support that. There's footage of the inspection, but how does the viewer know that that's not the same process that every other brand uses? Like, how do we know that you're telling the truth when you say that you're working on CSR because you got it wrong if you don't tell us what you've done to change and what steps you followed? Like, Misguided had actually been criticised in 2018 following the promotion of a £1 bikini because of the questionable ethics involved with making something that could be sold that cheaply and how it was encouraging people to buy things just because they were cheap. So for them to kind of brush over the ethical problems that they've had in the past and not mention their, at the time of recording, very recent issues makes it seem like they've actually not got a solid system in place to deal with these issues. And it's also interesting how in an interview, the CEO Nitin says that customers are the ones that are driving this super fast fashion and how even if Misguided wasn't doing it and wasn't producing garments at this speed, someone else would. Not really any discussion of what Misguided is doing differently or even doing at all to combat the environmental impact of the industry. It's just blaming it on customers and saying, you know, if people didn't want things fast, we wouldn't produce them fast. So really, it's your fault, not ours. Like, the guy interviewing him seemed to be pushing him for an answer as to what Misguided are doing differently, but Nitin very much just kind of skipped around that part of the question to indicate that the blame is not with the brands, but with the customers who want clothes. Which is an interesting way to go about things, you know, this is not going to encourage customers to come back to you when they want to know what you're doing about sustainability, and you're turning it back and saying, oh well if you didn't want any clothes then we would be sustainable but you want them so we can't be like that that's not a good look and it's not a good message to give to your customers and the employees then talk about how they're doing their best to be ethical and environmentally friendly and only one person gives a specific example which is using recycled packaging but this this example is immediately just like nullified and offset because it immediately cuts to Nitin saying that fabric production is the biggest environmental problem in fast fashion. No one says anything about their fabric production practices. No one says, oh, this is what we're doing to offset this. They just say, this is the biggest problem, but we're recycling our packaging. So like, it just seems irrelevant to talk about packaging when you're saying that that's not one of the biggest problems. And it's like, well, solve the big problems then? Don't solve the, the small ones? It's just so weird how they've kind of edited things together to produce a narrative that looks bad on the brand, because if these things were separated by something, it wouldn't be, they wouldn't link together as much, but the fact that it goes straight from saying, this is what we're doing, this other thing is the biggest problem and we're not doing anything to resolve that, it just, it doesn't look good on them. Like, it looks like they have chosen to recycle the packaging because it's cheaper to do that than it is to sort out the fabric production problems. So because those clips are cut together, that's the impression that the viewer gets. Whereas if they had put something in there to separate those two things, it wouldn't look as bad on them. Also, on the topic of supply, they then tried to describe Nitin's family as being in humble manufacturing, as if his granddad did not have an entire ass factory and his father did not have an entire ass fashion wholesale business, making enough money to just give away £50,000 to his son because he asked for it. This episode is also where there's an indication that the overbuying of the wrong things was why they lost so much money, because the team are talking about a specific item that they overstocked last season that didn't sell, and hence why they have to get it 100% right this time. However, overbuying one item does not lose a brand 26 million pounds. So there's either a much more widespread buying problem where they just were not listening to the customer, which would not surprise me, because like I said, I struggled to find things that I was interested in or misguided, or there was some other disaster that contributed to this that they don't want to explain in this documentary for whatever reason. And at the end of the episode, it shows what I assume is a financial team saying that the collection that we watched be produced made 1.1 million pounds, which was a 202% increase from the previous year. So this means that the previous year's collection made only roughly 360,000 pounds. And I don't know how much they spent on it, but unless they spent 26.36 million pounds on it, this collection is not the sole source of that massive loss. So episode four, honestly, is not that interesting. It shows the prep for Black Friday, shooting a winter sports campaign and the end of year staff party, but there wasn't really anything in this episode that I picked out as specifically interesting. It just kind of built on what we talked about previously. And overall, everyone within this company seemed to be extremely passionate about Misguided and what they're doing. 
But that passion seemingly just didn't translate into market success. Uh, either that or they were all really great actors and gave very convincing interviews, but they did all seem to genuinely love their jobs. It's just a shame that, you know, overall the brand just could not compile all that passion to make successful ideas and grow the brand. Like I have no idea what the, the massive problem was that lost them all this money, but whatever it was, they didn't talk about it in the documentary. And the documentary, it's extremely biased, which I think is kind of to be expected when it's essentially a promotional campaign for Misguided. You know, they're not gonna come off the back of losing 26 million pounds and be like, yeah, let's show everyone our factories where we pay people three pounds an hour. They're not gonna do that. They're gonna want it to look good for them. But at times it feels like you're watching actual propaganda because they're so quick to gloss over things that don't go their way, like the 26 million pound loss that is never explained, but is a very significant thing to happen. There is deliberate inclusion of the brand's recruitment for a diversity campaign and specifically long interviews with employees from working class backgrounds, talking about how amazing it is that Misguided gave them the chance to get into fashion, which like, it is, you know, they wouldn't be able to work for like Dior coming from a small kind of poor area in Manchester, but at the same time, it kind of feels like, you know, we only hear from those employees. We don't hear from the backgrounds of anyone else who works there, only the ones that have a kind of, I don't want to call it a sob story, but as in like they didn't come from a privileged background. I know that Misguided are probably getting massively paid for this documentary and that's why they have the power to skew things, but in an investigative documentary would have just been so much more interesting. Like, particularly at the time of the documentary's release in 2019, because Boohoo had just made headlines and Boohoo owns PLT, so they're kind of in this too. They had just made headlines and been widely criticized for awful working conditions in one of their factories in Leicester. So exploring the ethics of fast fashion in depth in at least one episode and talking about what Misguided is doing to combat that would have left a much better taste in the mouth than them simply saying they haven't always got it right in reference to being found out for using a supplier that was only paying workers three pound an hour in 2017. And I also took away from this that Misguided focused on short-term goals rather than long-term plans. Things were done off the cuff. There didn't seem to be a lot of strategy apart from get influencers to wear our clothes so people will buy them. They talk a lot about aggressive tactics and aggressive growth and disruption, but there doesn't seem to be a plan on how to do this apart from be aggressive and disruptive. That seems to be the kind of whole business plan. Like realistically, what does that mean? There's no real game plan here. Everyone knows what they're doing for the next week, but no one knows what they're gonna be doing in a year's time. There weren't any plans. There weren't any strategy, like five year growth plans for how the brand is gonna progress. Everything was just, this is what we're doing right now. This is what we need to focus on right now. And I think that's part of the reason why they failed because they just didn't look at the future and think, okay, what are we gonna be doing this time next year? And where do we want the brand to be? And one small point that I saw in a couple of reviews, which didn't bother me, but it probably would bother some people, um, was the language. It was constant swearing, vulgar phrases, which for some viewers might make for uncomfortable viewing. And I'm assuming that the company encouraged this because they wanted to seem edgy. That seems to be the kind of aim that they're going for. They want to seem like they don't follow the rules. That's a theme that they kept repeating throughout the documentary. But I personally would not have so associated like edgy with misguided. Like they're always talking about how they break boundaries and have an edge that other fast fashion companies don't. But to me, their products, their website and their campaigns just like never projected that. But maybe that's just me, I don't know. The documentary just, it seemed to focus more on what Misguided stood for and wanted to be, particularly the messages of good vibes and female empowerment, which were shoved down your throat every 10 seconds, and less about how they actually make their clothes and run their business. And even when they visit the factories and the warehouses, there's no explanation of how those places actually operate. It's just simply knitting, talking about the misguided branding and image whilst people do their jobs in the background. Like this frustrates me because I think it would be so interesting to see how they do things so fast, how these warehouses operate, how the garment workers are able to get things to stores so quickly. But there's just no explanation as of that, apart from the shots of the buying team negotiating prices and the designers talking about designing things. But we never actually see the designers making the designs. We don't see a garment go from design to production, which considering they say they can do that in three days, I would have expected to see 
at least like one garment, you know, focus on this and show us how you get it from design to production and how you get it from production to sale. You know, you were probably filming this documentary over the course of a month. There was enough time in there to do that and for some reason they didn't. And this whole thing is just kind of focused on what happens after a garment is made and that makes me question why was there so much content focusing on shooting campaigns and nothing about the very vital process that a garment goes through before it gets to that stage of being shot in a campaign. Also, I would, <laughs> this is just kind of my personal thing, but I would hate to work for a company where they make every single employee gather somewhere to view their new marketing strategy. Like, why does everyone need to be present to see the pink Rolls Royce roll into the car park? Like, you don't need to impress the employees, you need to impress the customers. Like, they do not need to be stood out in the freezing cold for this. And same with their new Christmas advert. Like, why does every single employee need to gather somewhere to watch the advert on the day that it comes out? They're gonna see it on TV anyway, so why can't you just send it in an email? Like, I would not be participating in those. I would be sat at my desk and be like, no, I'm not going out in the cold to go and see your Rolls Royce. I would not be participating in this, but maybe that's just me being lazy. So following the release of the documentary in 2019, where the brand pushed the idea that they were getting back on track, they were getting back on their feet, and they were creating a lot of successful campaigns and collections, 2020 came around and the fast fashion industry was hit hard by our good friend COVID-19. And COVID was a difficult time and still is a difficult time for a lot of people. Lockdowns meant that people weren't working or they were working from home. People were laid off or furloughed. No one could go out or go on holidays. And all of these restrictions meant that the need for fast fashion was vastly reduced. Don't get me wrong, people were still shopping. When people in the UK were furloughed, if you didn't have bills and rent to pay with that money, so like me, for example, I didn't go on furlough, but had I been on furlough, I would have definitely been buying things every single week because I'd have nothing to spend my money on. It was kind of like money for nothing if you didn't have those expenses. So spending it buying new clothes that you'd hopefully be able to wear when lockdown ends kind of seemed like a fun thing to do. And it kind of worked both ways. Some people were bored, they had money but nothing to spend it on, so they ended up ordering more than they usually would, whilst others had less money due to re reduced hours or furlough being 80% of their normal wage, so more of that had to go on their rent and their bills because they were having less disposable income, so they were buying less than the amount that they would usually buy from fast fashion sites. Or customers wouldn't buy clothes at all because they couldn't be sure when they were going to have the chance to wear them. You know, you don't want to buy a whole new summer wardrobe and the lockdown doesn't end until November. And there were obviously a lot of dis different situations that people were in, but overall the pandemic was a negative for fast fashion companies because primarily they provide clothes for occasions like nights out, holidays, meals out, birthdays, etc. And people weren't having those celebrations because lockdown meant that they could not leave the house for them. So they were not gonna need an outfit because they weren't going anywhere. The pandemic was also a negative because it affected supply chains where because of illness and reduced staff due to social distancing, the average wait times on garment production and delivery were increased. And this was a problem for fast fashion in particular because when the entire brand is built on being fast, it can quickly lose its customer appeal when it's not fast anymore. And the brands that chose to focus on new newness and speed failed to account for what they would do if circumstances outside of their control reduced their ability to deliver new things quickly. So Misguided very much died by its own sword because it made a, such a huge deal about its speed of garment production being its USP against other brands. COVID-19 and lockdown, I think, also made people more aware of how environmentally damaging their shopping habits may be because the buildup of clothes that you'll wear once becomes a lot more apparent when you've got nowhere to wear them. Sustainability and attempting to shop more sustainably is a movement that's been kind of slowly developing over a number of years, but in the past, like, three to five years has suddenly just taken off, with climate change making people more acutely aware aware of how damaging the constant stream of poor quality new clothes that often end up in landfill is. And the materials used in fast fashion clothing are not from sustainable sources because those would cost more and would up the price of the garment, which is opposite to these brands ethos and would defeat the whole point of being fast and cheap. So those clothes are particularly bad for the environment and when they're only being worn once for a night out then thrown away, that's a lot of clothes that are going to end up in landfill sites. And as a result of people becoming more aware of this, they are starting to shop either secondhand from websites like eBay, Vinted and Depop or from vintage stores, 
or from brands with a focus on sustainability and eco-friendliness, of which Misguided is not. And the recent season of Love Island being sponsored by eBay instead of a fast fashion brand, I think has definitely been a turning point because it's subconsciously shown to millions of viewers, like this series has been one of the best viewed series, at least in the first few weeks. And it's shown to young people in the UK that you can still look good while shopping sustainably. And I think the denouncement of fast fashion by the most popular reality show in the country will drive more people to look for secondhand clothing because the whole point of this show is that you look good. You know, people are let onto Love Island because they are good looking. So showing that they are wearing secondhand clothing and you can't even tell is gonna push people to buy more stuff secondhand editing me here so i just wanted to also say that since i filmed this video uh, ebay signed tasha who was widely regarded as being like, the best dressed girl this season as their first ever secondhand ambassador so that is also going to push people towards buying secondhand because influencers are now partnering with sustainable fashion brands and fashion retailers like ebay to push sustainability and secondhand shopping particularly because Tasha has just come off Love Island, so she's kind of in the peak of her popularity right now. Pretty much every fast fashion brand except PLT that's based in the UK has reported losses since COVID, including ASOS and Boohoo, and the new sustainability trend is absolutely not going to help their cases, and it was definitely one of the contributing factors to why Misguided failed, because, for example, PLT is trying to incorporate sustainability. I think they are in the process of creating an app where you can swap your old PLT clothes with other people's old PLT clothes or sell them back to the brand so that they're not going to landfill uh, whereas other brands just are not seemingly doing anything or at least publicly not doing anything I think ASOS does put like little notes on stuff if it's low carbon emissions but you know realistically when they stock so much stuff it's not going to be sustainable now we've had the kind of overview of the general problems for the industry let's talk about what actually happened with misguided so the first point where it looked like misguided might be struggling was in december 2021 when a 50 percent stake in the brand was sold to alteri investors in the hopes that the extra cash injection from the sale would give the brand more liquidity when it was struggling with supply chains as a result of not only covid but also brexit here in the uk we've had a lot of problems getting things shipped from overseas because we're no longer allowing EU nationals to work. So the people who were, a lot of the people who were driving HGV lorries were EU nationals and they're now not able to do that. So that's great for us. Here in the UK, we really are paying for the consequences of our actions. Anyways, Misguided had actually managed to pull itself back from its 47 million pound loss in 2018 to a much less significant 5 million loss in 2019. And it did for a while do okay during the pandemic because people were shopping for loungewear and sportswear, things that often people go to Primark for because the joggers are like four pounds, but Primark doesn't have an online shop. So all of Primark's previous customers were looking for somewhere else to buy their cheap loungewear and fast fashion retailers could do pretty well by focusing on those items instead of the usual going out clothes. However, Misguided failed to continue its positive trajectory and we're gonna talk about the main reason for that in a bit, don't worry. But by December 2021, the 50% stake uh, sale was the only thing that kept them afloat. And Alteri Investors is a firm that focuses on underperforming businesses and they did attempt to save Misguided by making redundancy and demanding a 30% cut in the price of all garments from suppliers, even on orders which had already been delivered. And Nitin Passi then stepped down as CEO in April 2022. I'm not 100% sure how involved he was with the business from there. I can't imagine that he left completely, but there was no reports I could find saying that a new CEO had been appointed. So I'm guessing they didn't appoint anyone new because by May 2022, the company went into liquidation. I'm guessing Nissin stepped down due to internal pressures because investors were very aware that they were not doing well and they blamed him as the CEO. On May 10th, the company went into administration following a wind-up petition from one of its suppliers, JSK Fashion. 
The week prior to this, it had been reported in newspapers that three of the brand's suppliers were at risk of collapse because Misguided was their only customer and had not paid them anything. One factory owner claimed he had to sell his wife and mother's jewellery in order to be able to pay his workers, and another said that the company owed them more than two million pounds, hence why they sought Misguided's compulsory liquidation, as this would mean that the assets that the brand had at the time of liquidation would be sold and that cash would be divided up between the secured creditors in order to repay the company's debts and apparently the excuse given to suppliers in April was that the payments were going to be temporarily ceased due to restructuring internally and then when suppliers tried to contact Mis Misguided to ask about where their money was people would refuse to answer the phones they wouldn't reply to emails to the point where some suppliers actually turned up at the head office and Misguided's response to that was to call the police and send all the employees home so that no one could talk to the suppliers. It was also sad watching the documentary there were scenes where one of the supply factory owners was everyone was saying he was such a nice guy just trying to do the best for his workers and how partnering with Misguided would be such a huge opportunity for him and now we can see that three years after that was filmed Misguided took the products from his factory and didn't pay for them so him and his workers were then all left out of pocket and it's kind of bitten them in the ass to show this in the documentary because now there's names and faces to match with the suppliers which are usually faceless so it will evoke more of an emotional response to the fact that misguided collapse and left these people millions of pounds out of pocket the interviews that the suppliers gave during the administration really did not make misguided look good they said that they were having to work for margins of two to five percent and what we saw in the documentary about misguided haggling for the cheapest prices as humanly possible supports this allegation that they were making and they also said that when Misguided needed something, they would call the supplier like 20 times a day for it. But when the suppliers were struggling and they weren't being paid, Misguided would just halt payments with no warning or explanation, leaving the factory owners to take out personal loans and sell their possessions in order to pay their staff's wages. And Misguided officially entered administration on the 30th of May and this left many customers angry and upset because basically what it meant was that anyone who was owed a refund from the company for an order placed before the 30th of May was considered to be an unsecured creditor and the only way that they could get their money back from Misguided would be to make a claim in the administration but they would be paid, placed in a queue behind all the secured creditors which included all the suppliers, Altieri, any banks that Misguided had taken loans from so they would basically never get their money back that way. So they could try under Section 75 of the Consumer Credit Act if they paid with a credit card for something worth more than £100 to get their money back that way because that uh, section makes credit card companies equally liable for if something goes wrong. But apart from that, the only option that you could use if you paid with a debit card or through PayPal or whatever was to make a chargeback through the bank if the bank was able to get that money back. And this left customers feeling particularly sour because the website was still actively accepting orders through this time, despite there being a massive delay on shipping and no refunds being issued if clothes were returned. Supposedly, the company would honour any refund for an order placed after the 31st of May. However, a quick Twitter search proves this is not the case because people were still unable to get their money back from the retailer for those orders. And they then changed the date to say you had to order after the 16th of June. Bye me again uh so misguided has actually conveniently removed all statements from their website referencing the administration uh they've deleted all of their tweets between the 30th of may and the 28th of july which showed the inconsistencies between the dates that people could get refunds for and i also looked on their website to see if i could find the faqs page because the link on their twitter doesn't work anymore it's in due to an error 404 page and the description for Misguided is the description for Flannels, which is also owned by Fraser's group. But someone has just copied and pasted the description from Flannels onto the Misguided website. They haven't changed it at all. Uh, there's no information about Misguided on there. It's just, you know, if you wanted to know about Flannels, here's all the info you might need. So on the 1st of June, Misguided was bought for £20 million by Fraser's group, which owns House of Fraser and Sports Direct. And Mike Ashley, the head of the group, said that Misguided would be operating under administrators for a period of eight weeks. So it should be out of administration by the time that you see this video. However, I'm not sure that that is the case. They've not really said very much about it. 
So the website for the company relaunched on the 17th of June and has been available to make purchases from ever since. So the company statement now says that any order placed before the 16th of June was considered to be placed with Misguided Limited. And since that company no longer exists and no longer owns the warehouses, you can't return any products to them and all you can do is make an unsecured creditor claim. They also say that any orders placed before the 16th of June which have not been delivered are not going to be delivered because they were also placed with Misguided Limited and the only way to get the refund is to claim as an unsecured creditor, which that's just like crappy behaviour to say, you know, we've got all these products in our warehouses because they've taken all the stock from Misguided but they're not going to honour any of these orders. So, you know, if you want your money back, you have to claim in the administration because they will know that claiming the administration will not go that those, get those people their money back because they know that being an unsecured creditor puts you right at the end of the queue. So basically what they're saying is we're just going to keep your money because you can't do anything about it. So this is just very shabby customer service from Fraser's group. Obviously, they don't want to pay off Misguided's debts, but they did have a massive sale, which was claimed to try and clear the warehouse. So they clearly have all the old stock in their possession and I just don't understand why they can't fulfill orders that were made prior to the administration. And this sale was also a disaster. It was 80% off everything, but it cost £4.99 for shipping, which is a lot in comparison to other brands. Like I think ASOS is 3 dollars PLT is the same. Normally if you order over a certain amount, it's free, but I don't think that's the case with Misguided. Um, but orders were not being sent out until 10 plus days after purchase. And if you wanted to return anything, you also had to pay the return postage yourself. So if you were sending back any big items like coats or shoes, those parcels were gonna cost like 10 pounds to ship. So it also looks like there were people who ordered things and sent things back and haven't received any refunds. So the entire thing is just a complete mess right now. And I don't know how they're planning to come back from this when they've had two months of just disaster after disaster, terrible customer service and no update on how they plan to bring this brand back. Like even now I'm seeing constantly people saying I've ordered something and not received it or I've not received my refund or I can't log into my account after I've made an order. And it just seems like they have no kind of concept of how they're going to resolve this brand. They're not prioritizing customer service, which you think they would, considering that they need to keep those customers on side with the amount of competition that there is from fast fashion brands at the moment. And one reason why I think they will struggle to recover and one reason why they have failed to recover after COVID and ended up collapsing is the absolute boom in their competitor in Shein. So Shein is a Chinese fast fashion retailer that takes the fast in fast fashion to a whole new level. They add 10,000 new items to their website per day, a rate that no other retailer can even dream of matching. And they are able to do this because they are fully responsible for everything in their supply chain from design to manufacture to shipping. They don't have any external suppliers to rely on, so they can basically do whatever they want. And Shein saw a huge rise in popularity during the pandemic, mostly due to TikTok and people doing Shein haul videos. Shein has always been cheap, but it's never been reputable. And I think people on TikTok constantly pushing Shein, saying, you know, look at all this great stuff that I got from Shein, encouraged more people to buy from Shein. And now we've ended up with like, a massive boom in Shein. You know, everyone is buying from Shein. It's also the perfect place to shop when you don't have much money. It's the perfect place to fulfill shopping cravings when you don't want to break the bank. So a lot of people started to use Shein during the pandemic and a lot of people started to make Shein haul videos having seen how well they do on social media and how little it costs the items in order to do one. You know, anyone who wants to start a fashion channel or a fashion TikTok account probably has done a Shein haul in the early stages of doing that because those hauls are so much cheaper to do in comparison to other websites. So in comparison to their competitors, Shein is significantly cheaper. You can get tops for like three pounds, whereas on Misguided, they would have been 12. And here in the UK, there is not the supply options to make things that cheaply within the remits of our laws. So unless companies wanted to outsource to places like China where they could massively underpay their workers, they can't compete with Shein. And Shein also designed their website to keep people on there for as long as possible by offering huge discounts like 80% off, outfits for a pound, and constant flash sales to get people to scroll through lots of items in order to find a good bargain before it disappears. And this also plays into the cheapness aspect because Misguided could not afford to constantly offer clothes at 80% off. You know, when it did a bikini for a pound, they got massively criticized because of its supply chains being based in the UK. 
and people were then immediately concerned that they were not complying with the wage laws in the UK. With Shein, they aren't based in the UK and they don't uh, disclose anything about their supply chains publicly. So whilst people point out that it's literally impossible for them to be paying a decent living wage, because it's not happening in the UK, the brand just ignore it and continue to make extremely cheap clothes that more often than not, consumers are too tempted by and will lead them to ignore the red flags of lack of sustainability and likely poor working conditions. And Shein also thrived because they were just smarter than the other brands. Shein invested a lot of money into advertising algorithms that would detect which clothes were popular with consumers and then put them in social media adverts for consumers of a similar demographic and place those clothes at the top of the listings on the website. And Shein uses big data tools to scour the internet and viral trends to determine what items of clothing they should make next, something that other companies aren't really doing. They're relying on humans to do that rather than data tools. So Shein can always be the first to churn out 100 products in a popular new style because their algorithms would know that was something was becoming popular before it became a huge trend. And they can also track what's being purchased constantly. So the website itself can automatically alter the listings to make sure that the popular items appear at the top and encourage people to buy more things and especially in the current times when there's a significant cost of living crisis which is limiting people's abilities to buy clothes a lot of people are looking for the cheapest option for new clothes or occasion outfits rather than focusing on buying from somewhere sustainable because when money is tight uh, cost has to come first and when cost comes first Shein is the cheapest option out there and Shein's value was placed at 100 billion dollars earlier this year and their app overtook Amazon to become the most downloaded app from the app store in May 2022. The hashtag Shein haul on TikTok has over 5.8 billion views and it's not showing any signs of stopping. Every day they add more items, they reach more people, they produce more advertisements and they are seemingly pretty much unstoppable. They are pricing out all of the other fast fashion brands because no one else can offer that variety of items at that low of a price and whilst Misguided was the first to fall, I don't think that they will be the last. So the last thing I want to do is just discuss whether I think Misguided will be able to make a comeback. Obviously, Shein is not going anywhere, but the UK government is planning to introduce an extended producer responsibility tax for fashion brands, um, meaning that garments sold to UK customers will be subject to an extra tax charge, which will then go towards investing in the reduction of textile waste and investment in new tech to make fashion greener. But this isn't in place yet and it's not clear how it would affect the ability of companies like Shein to sell their clothes at such a cheap price here. But obviously Shein has a lot of US customers and well, customers all over the world. So having that tax in the UK is not gonna stop them from selling at the same price elsewhere. And in terms of misguided themselves, if I'm being honest, I don't think the products themselves were unique enough for people to miss them because there's the option to get pretty much the same thing from websites like Shein, PLT, Boohoo, ASOS. You know, misguided wasn't offering something different because what they originally prided themselves on was the speed of getting the garments to the website and then from the website to the customer. So now that PLT and Boohoo have their own UK factories, they're all on the same level in terms of how fast they can produce new items and Shein's offering 10,000 new items per day. So unless a brand is offering something unique in terms of the actual products themselves, they aren't gonna get anywhere and going under is likely gonna be the end of that brand because their customers can so easily go elsewhere. And I also think Misguided was particularly pricey for fast fashion. Dresses and coats would be like 60 to 70 pounds, whereas on Boohoo, they'd be like 20 to 30 pounds. And I don't think that the clothing quality was much higher than Boohoo and PLT. So unless Misguided were going to change supplier and lower their price, I don't think that they're going to be able to compete with their cheaper rivals. And they've also shown themselves to have very bad buying habits when it comes to choosing their stock as evidenced by their documentary. So there would need to be a lot of work done to the company and a lot of new people brought in to really rectify the mistakes of the past. And I don't know if Fraser's group has the people necessary to do that since House of Fraser has been over the last year closing a significant amount of stores due to lack of revenue. And also the customer trust just is not there. Even post administration announcement, people aren't receiving their orders. The customer care is awful, refunds are not being processed, so people are naturally going to be put off buying from them when they can't trust the brand to A, deliver the items, and B, deliver an acceptable level of customer service and compensation for those items. They've had so much bad press on social media over the past two months that I just don't know if it's possible to make a recovery from that much 
opposition to them and to clear their name. And honestly, I just don't think the takeover will be successful. I think Misguided should have just been left to collapse because it's been doing badly for four years. It's not like it was just hit suddenly out of nowhere and everything's gone wrong in one go. They've been on the verge of collapse for a long time and no one seems to have done anything about it. Misguided is a victim of growing too quickly and not having the management to deal with that growth in a way that continues to grow the company. So it ended up just becoming stagnant and boring in comparison to its rivals who were continually trying to up their game. And some of the people in the documentary were obviously very good at their jobs, but they must have been the only ones because there didn't seem to be anyone who knew how to take the company forward in an increasingly competitive and fierce market. Okay, so that is everything that I have to say about the rise and downfall of Fashion Giant Misguided. It has been a bit of a slog, but we got there in the end. Uh, I hope you guys did enjoy the video. If you did, don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment with any thoughts that you might have, and subscribe to see more videos like this. I will leave my other rise and downfall of videos about fashion brands in the description down below if you want to watch any of those. And if you have any thoughts, do you think Misguided will return? Have you ordered from them since then? Then let me know in the comments. Apart from that, uh, I will hopefully see you guys in the next one. Bye guys!